today I can do nothing better than preach the Word of God. After sitting and listening to the wonderful words of Mahila Jackson and hearing that well-renowned Negro spiritual and sitting in awe and listening to Elder Scott Whitehead Jr. reading of the scripture reading with such poise, eloquence, intonation, inflection, he made me be right there with Jephthah and all that he was going through. Thank you so much. And I just want to remind the folk that at four, we will be having a special program with Dr. Theodore Garnett, all about vaccinations. And we're glad that Elder King uh, allowed himself to be not a guinea pig, but to take the vaccine and show us that it's okay. I'm standing before you myself, having had my second shot last Tuesday. The word of caution is for me to continue doing the things like social distancing, washing my hands, wearing a mask, not congregating, because now that I'm protected, I am in a somewhat of a dangerous class, meaning I'm assured that I will never get sick from COVID-19. I will not experience any symptoms, but I can still catch it. And if I catch it and don't know I have it, and I don't practice the things I need to do, I may unwittingly give it to other people. So this afternoon, I'm looking forward to hearing Dr. Garnett as he would share with us. Uh, this morning, we want to join Patria extending our condolences to her, the death of her brother. We want to remember that family, uh, lift them up in prayer. And uh, there is a young lady presently in the hospital right now, Janet Hyman, fighting for her life. And, and I was asked to remember her in prayer. And Elder Carol Thomas just gave some information, and I'd like to pay heed to what she said, and that is to, if you're asked to pray for someone, coming from the late elder Fred Norris, let us do that right away. So I will stop right now and offer a word of prayer for Janet Hyman, who is fighting for her life right now in a hospital. Father in heaven, I pray today that you will take this daughter of yours, we have no knowledge of her illness. We just heard that her situation is grave. And if there is a doctor that can heal, it is Dr. Jesus. And so right now, we present Janet before you and ask that your will be done in her life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I was driving in this morning, I engage in my favorite activity, that is every Sabbath morning I have a telephone conversation with my mother. And she was a little sad today, uh, and she asked me, my, mo my mother's a very comical lady, and I smile when I say that. She asked me if I'm going to the party tonight. And I said, a party? She says, were you not invited? And, and I said, no. I'm thinking, well, maybe one of my sisters or brother is having a party and they didn't remember me. And she said, what day is today? And today happens to be February 6th. My sister, Willetta, would have been 6th to 4 today. And so my mom is trying to lighten 
the moment. I thank God that a time will come when this thing called death will no longer be a part of our world. And for all the others who are listening who may be in similar situations where you've lost loved ones, I ask you to look to God today. And I want to give a special shout out to former pastor of this church, Pastor Claude Shaw. He tunes in every Sabbath and he listens. And I would imagine the feedback that I get from his dear wife, some of it comes from him. We are thankful that God has allowed you to be able to listen understand and continue to praise him now it's time for the word of God but before I share this word today I am compelled to just take us back to when we started in January some of you may recall that the invitation was given on my first sermon in January that this year we will try to discover and rediscover God. And in these 66 books, Genesis to Revelation, we find the Word of God. And in this search, I've discovered so far that there are some verses or some chapters or even some books that we do not preach on at all. Maybe we are afraid that they're too tough. And so when I embarked on this quest for discovering and rediscovering God, I myself found out that on certain books and chapters, things are silent. So far, the sermons I've preached, we began, first sermon was, So You Think You Know Him. And we look at Matthew and we trace the ancestry of Jesus. And we look at Perez, whose father was Judah. And Judah was the man who thought that he was having a rendezvous with a prostitute, but it was his daughter-in-law dressed up as one, and it was from that union that came Perez, that came Obed, that came Boaz, that came Jesse, we have what we call the Lion of the tribe of Judah. What a way for Jesus to come into the world. So you think you know him. And then we looked at a dismembered wife. And we saw how a Levite was revered. A woman was cruelly treated. And the Israelites were more concerned about him. Not the woman. And the response was to go to war. And they made a mistake in trying to wipe out a whole tribe rather than deal with the matter at hand. And last week, we looked at kidnapped virgins. And we discovered that sometimes we blame others for the problems we create. We also discovered that we need to be careful of the solution we seek to solve the problems. For sometimes we repeat the same mistake in the search for the solution. In this case, their solution was to wipe out the tribe of Benjamin. And their solution again, when the Gileads did not come, was to wipe out the tribe of Gilead. They had not learned any lesson. And then last but not least, last week we discovered that some may try to destroy you, but God is not done with you yet. He still has a work for you to do. Yes, 
the Israelites tried to destroy Jabesh Gilead. But it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who went to Bethshan and removed the body of Saul that was left hanging by the Philistines. In desecration, these men took Saul's body and gave him a decent funeral or burial. The same people that were being slaughtered. And we discovered also that with the tribe of Benjamin being wiped out, had that been able to be done, we would have never had the first king of Israel who was Saul, and he came from the tribe of Benjamin. As we continue this week, we'll be looking at the death of an innocent virgin. Father, come now and instruct, put words in my mouth, not of my doing, but words that you would have me speak in Jesus' name. Amen. As Elder Scott read so well, here we have Jephthah growing up with his brothers. Nothing is wrong as they're growing up. But as they got older, Gilead, Jephthah's father, dies. And these brothers said, at the death of our father, we have to divide the inheritance. But because you came not from our mother, you did not even come from another woman. <laughs> the Bible says that threw him out because his mother was a prostitute. His mother was a prostitute. And they said that you are not going to get any part of the inheritance because of your mother. I want us to stop and think. Take that account and put it into today's context. I was shocked because when I read the account, a word flashed into my head, and the word is bastard. And surely I looked it up because I thought that that is a word that would be in the dictionary, but I would never find that word in the Bible. Well, this guy Jephthah is written of in the book of Hebrews. Interestingly enough, we call Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith. It names Enoch and Moses and Elijah and Abraham and Deborah. It names Rahab. She's in that chapter. Well, I've been reading that chapter a long time. But for some reason prior to this message, I never saw Jephthah's name in there. And you'll understand the significance as to why it is important to acknowledge that his name is written in the hall of faith by the right of the Hebrews. Read with me what it says. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, 
administered justice and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames, and escape the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed before foreign armies. This is Jephthah. He is recorded in the book of Hebrews. That tells me this brother, his salvation is sealed. He is going to be in the resurrection, but he is named among a special group. Jephthah, the guy whose brothers said, you can't live with us because of the way you were conceived. This brings me to my first of three points today. And I want to encourage you as members and listeners. I get feedback, wonderful commentary, text messages, emails. But please know that your pastor is also open for questions or anything else you want to say that will help to make me a better preacher. And here we find these brothers saying that this guy Jephthah is not good enough because his mother was a prostitute. My first point is this. Some may reject you. Listen to this. Some may reject you not because of what you've done, but because of how you were conceived. Let me say that again. Some may reject you not because of what you've done, but because of how you were conceived. In other words, even today in our culture, if your parents were not married and you were conceived out of wedlock, they had a word for you. And I was shocked, Dr. King, I was shocked to find this word in the Bible. In the Bible, read with me what it says. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 2. The Hebrew word there is manzir, M-A-M-Z-E-R. And the actual translation of that word to me is even worse than our context of bastard. The, the translation of manzir is polluted. Hold a minute. Hold it right there. Are you telling me that a child who was not born in wedlock is polluted? Is less than? Are we to walk around asking people, were your parents married? Are you a manzir? Are you being treated? Jephthah, you got to go. You're not going because of anything you've done. You're going because of who your mother was. We call ourselves Christians. We need to be careful because we take the Levitical system and we do not understand what it says in Deuteronomy. Yes, you had a system. Moses had laws. Some of it we wouldn't even want to think about. In that same Deuteronomy 23, when you have time, read verse 1 and see what it says. Who could not have entered 
the temple. A physical defect would have kept you out of the temple. We need to appreciate that when Jesus Christ came, his declaration through the apostle Paul was simply this. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Don't tell somebody they're not good enough because their parents were not married when they were conceived. That's how we judge people. And here the Bible refers to Jephthah as a bastard. As a bastard. And so we need to be careful of when we come to people that we're not asking anything about where they're from how were they born how they were conceived were your parents married let me let me take a minute to emphasize what's wrong with it abraham maslow in his hierarchy of needs makes the point that we have psychological needs. In his pyramid, he says that the need to belong is primary for human development. And when people tell you you have to go, when you're being excluded, when you're being pushed aside, not because of anything you've done, you didn't kill anyone. You didn't steal from anyone. Simply in our clique, we only have people who come from well-established families. We deny people the existence of belonging because we are not happy as to how they were conceived. His brothers threw him out. He was not welcome there anymore. I believe that as the Bible tells us, that Jephthah was a warrior. And when he left, the Bible tells us he went to this place called Tob. I looked it up, and there is no definitive answer for Tob. It's a little beyond Jordan, about 13 miles east of Galilee. And Tob is only mentioned twice in the Bible. So what am I trying to say about the place to where this guy went? I would like to think that when a person has been thrown out, that God has a tub for you. My second point is, God always has a tub, a place of refuge, a place where people are not caught up with how you were conceived. Let me say that again. God always has a tub, have a, th a tub, a place of refuge, a place where people are not caught up with how you were conceived. In this sense, speaking to you directly now, in this sense, is it possible that your home was a top? You see, I grew up in a home where you got 13, 15 people in a four-bedroom flat. And for some reason, my mother was always bringing people in. My home was a kind of top. I never heard the question asked about parentage. And in my street where I grew up in Carmichael Street, many of the homes had the same thing. People could find a place of refuge. Whatever they were kicked out from, they were able to find a place to be. It was a place for the unwanted. 
in your home presently is your home a top is it a place where the unwanted may find refuge we do not hear anything about Gilead's wife it was a patriarchal society and men ruled in that day women had little to say or had any control over what is done she's not mentioned in the story maybe maybe even though the Bible does not mention her, I am taking liberty with the fact that the Bible says when the boys grew up, they threw him out. In other words, when they grew up, they assumed the position of leadership in the home because they were adult males. So when they grew up, their father was dead, and now they're in charge. And they said, Jephthah, you got to go. Is it possible? And listen to me, folk. Is it possible that there was a mother in that home who took Jephthah in and helped raise him until she no longer had the ability or the authority to do so? Maybe she did her best. And when she could no longer have control, he was no longer a, a resident in their domicile. I want to take a moment right now. Let me just pause for a brief second to give a shout out to all the women in Israel who have taken in the Jephthahs of the world. They are women who have raised children that they did not conceive nor deliver. And they raised them just as if they came from their own bowels. A child conceived out of wedlock by a father and brought to the home and this home, whatever the name of the home was, it became a tub because the mother in that home welcomed that child that had nothing to do with his birth. So I want to give a shout out to you mothers in Israel that took the Jephthahs of the world, children that didn't belong, and you gave them a place to live. You never considered them bastards. And while I give that shout out, and I say this in love, you know who you are. And I pray it is none that is listening, but maybe you know someone and you can pass the message along or share the sermon while we shout out those who made their homes a tarp and they welcomed the ostracized and the outcast, there were some who did not. They were given the opportunity to help raise a Jephthah and they said no and some did worse. Some took in Jephthah and they treated him badly. They made sure he didn't eat when their children ate. They made sure he didn't get new clothes, that he wore hang-me-downs. They made sure that he never forgot. He would always remember that he was not a real child because his mother was no good. So let me lovingly say, if this word gets to you and you were such a mother, or a father that decided you could not take in a Jephthah, or you know that you did a Jephthah wrong, it's not too late to pick up the phone. Call that child who may be now a man or a woman and say, listen, I want you to forgive me for what I did. I had you in my environment and I mistreated you. You were not a bad kid. I mistreated you because of your father. 
I mistreated you because you did not come from my loins. And so today, my second point is, God always has a top, a place of refuge, a place where people are not caught up with how you are conceived. And so to my young friends listening today, and I believe the young folk can teach us many lessons. You watch them play and interact. They don't care if you're straight or gay. They don't care if your parents were married. They don't care if you're black or white. They understand that the love of God must be demonstrated. And anything that's going to change somebody is the unconditional love of God. Isn't that what God is all about? Last but not least, we have an interesting story of this man, Jephthah. So I can tell you what happens. They come to him because they know he can fight. And they say, Jephthah, the Ammonites are just bothering us. C could you come back and help us? That's a whole nother sermon. I'm not going to speak that today. When people throw you out and then they have to come and call you back in. And he said, well, if I'm going to come back, you guys got to make me head. And now they were willing to give him anything. And they made a vow, we're going to make you head. And Jephthah goes in. And verse 30 says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house, Pay attention to the word whatever because the message gets kind of confusing to some who don't pay attention to that word whatever. Whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Say that with me everybody sacrifice it as a what? Burnt offering. You will see later on how some scholars are dancing all around that text because they just can't accept that a daughter was sacrificed. They want to give another explanation. I read for you verse 30. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. A vow that he did not need to make. My third and final point is, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. Jephthah did not need to make this vow. Do you know why? Because the verse before it, 29, you have to get the sequence. In verse 29 of Judges 11, here is what it says. After Jephthah says, I'm going to go and fight, read what it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Hey, Jephthah, the Bible says that the Lord's Spirit came on him. Why in the world now, after you heard the Lord's Spirit, you go and make a vow? And Jephthah made a vow, verse 30. Verse 29, the Lord's Spirit. Jephthah did not need to make any vow because he was already in the power of the Spirit. Be careful, little monk, what you say. He makes a vow. He makes a vow. While already being in the power of the Spirit. Watch this now. Is it not possible that we can be foolish even while being in the power of the Spirit? 
he had already been under the power of the Spirit in verse 29. And now in verse 30, he's making a vow. A vow for which he will regret. regret. Whatever comes out of my home, he says. Whatever comes out. Whatever comes out of my home. That vow should not have been made. You know why? Deuteronomy 18.10 says, coming from Moses, and remember now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Je Jephthah comes after Deuteronomy. He knew the law. And read what the law says. Let no one be found among you who what? Sacrifices their son or their daughter in the fire who practices divination or sorcery interprets omens, engages in witchcraft. Jephthah knew that this was not God's. That's Deuteronomy. And in Judges, the man makes a vow when God did not ask him to make a vow. So sometimes, watch me now, sometimes on the God's power, Good people can do stupid things. And yet, in Hebrews, Jephthah is recorded in the hall of faith. Hey, there's hope for me and you. It means that a child of God doesn't mean he was blameless, spotless, but God says, in spite of your foolishness, I'm still yours. You're still mine. And now, now let us hasten to conclude this message. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Dancing to the sound of timbrels, she was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. Oh! He said, whatever comes out of my house. So I have to paint the picture for you. The Ammonites had been defeated. Word had gotten back to the homeland. And people were celebrating. And part of the celebration they had timbrels and they would dance. And Jephthah's daughter heard. She heard what her daddy did. She was proud of her daddy. She was happy for her daddy. She was happy for Israel. Little did she know that her daddy had done something foolish. And so when she heard of the victory, she rushed out to the house not knowing that Jephthah had said whatever. First comes out of the house, I will offer as a sacrifice unto the Lord. Well, a lot of Bible scholars have problems with this story because in their minds, they could not see how Jephthah was never condemned in Scripture for what he did. And so they found an alternate way of looking at things. They said that Jephthah's sacrifice, and, and they go to the part, and when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I'm devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. I, I will never marry. Some scholars have made a whole theology out of that because I will never marry. They have construed that Jephthah did not sacrifice his daughter in the literal sense. She was banished to the temple where she would live as a virgin for the rest of her life. And so by not marrying for the rest of her life, 
That is how the vow was fulfilled. That is not what the Bible says. And I'm going to tell you why I disagree with all of these scholars. By the way, I went looking to the spirit of prophecy and I read where Ellen White talked of Jephthah, but she doesn't mention this part of the vows at all. Doesn't mention it. And maybe I think it is just so simple to understand. To some it may not be simple. Let me go back to the word whatever. Jephthah said, whatever comes out of my house, now we have to imagine what's in his house. Did he have a wife in the house? The Bible doesn't tell us. Did he have Animals in the house? The Bible doesn't tell us. It only tells us that he had no other children. Now, for the vow to mean that it's only his daughter going to be living as a virgin in the temple and serving God for the rest of li her life, that's the sacrifice. For that to mean that, it would mean that when Jephthah said whatever, he was kidding himself. That he must have known it was his daughter that was going to come out of the house. I contend he meant whatever. He had no idea that it was his daughter. And the Bible says that she was sacrificed. He kept his vow and she was sacrificed as a burnt offering. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. What Jephthah didn't know and what we need to remember even today. That when man sinned, God had a plan. And I want you to hear the word counterfeit. A counterfeit is something that is fake, false to the real. Every plan God has, the devil has a counterfeit. God says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. The devil says, hey, remember the first day Christ was resurrected. That was something good. Keep that day holy. Everything God has as a plan the devil has a counterfeit god says when you have a baby bring that baby and dedicate that baby to me place me in charge of that child the devil says we're gonna have a christening he has a counterfeit and god in his plan when man fell he knew before the foundation of the world that Jesus would have been the sacrificial lamb. And so Israel were, was instructed that you must bring a lamb without spot or blemish and you sacrifice that lamb on the day of atonement. And everybody who saw that helpless lamb, that innocent lamb, it would point them to the time when the lamb of God so when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So what did the devil say? Oh yeah, you guys have Jesus as the sacrificial lamb, but I have Chemosh. I have other gods that you can, I have Molech. You can sacrifice your children into the fire for Molech, that's a counterfeit. And even though Jephthah lived for God, he was caught up with the practice. And remember that the Spirit of God was on Jephthah in verse 29. He had no need to make a promise. And in verse 30, he made a vow and he carried out his vow. Be careful, little mouths, what you say. 
what God wants us to know today is that Jesus is the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. And when Jesus on that Thursday night, when he could bear the pain no more, he said, my God, my God, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And on the cross, when the pain became unbearable, he said, Lama Sabatanai, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the Bible says, then he said, it is finished. That's the sacrifice. Jephthah didn't need to put his daughter on any fire so he can keep a vow. Lesson is, if we make a mistake and say something foolish, we don't have to keep that vow. Jephthah is listed in the hall of faith in spite of that experience. So today, my friends, let me conclude by saying, some may reject you not because of what you've done, but because of how you were conceived. God always have a tab, a place of refuge, a place where people are not caught up with how you were conceived. And God wants you to be tabs today. Embrace someone. Let them know they belong even when others are ejecting and eliminating them. And finally, be careful Little mouths, what you say. The next time I stand at this desk, I want you to go and read up on this guy Lot and his daughters and what happened in a cave with them when he was drunk. Remember, this year we're dealing with passages, we're searching and we're asking God, uh, do you have lessons in this book? Are we guilty of only wanting the lessons that seem to, to support and coincide with what we want? God, we are asking you to help us to rediscover you. We believe in every story. We know that sometimes things are recorded for information. We know sometimes you are giving instruction. We know sometimes you are giving what the pharmacists give, prescriptions. Sometimes you are giving us imperatives, but we pray that we will never get to the place where we think that you're not speaking to us through this word. May God help us. This virgin died willingly, just like Isaac was willing to be sacrificed by his father Abraham. May God help us today to watch what we say. May God help us today to be open and to be tops. May God help us today not to reject anyone because of how they were conceived. Father, we thank you so much for your book. We know there are some things here that make it hard for us to understand. But may we not shy away from them. Thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.